Hey everybody, it's Moonbo here, and welcome back to some more Scrap Mechanic Survival. Now, this isn't going to be a normal episode of Survival. This is going to be a tutorial or guide on some of the essential tools and parts that you use in Survival Mode. Now, as for the normal Survival progress, I'm here. Uh, Komodo Gaming helped me move my entire base, so I've got a lot of work to do ahead of me. I've got some unpacking to do, I've got some clearing out to do, and of course, I've got a lot of building to do for my base. I'm going to be getting to that very soon. So, like I said at the beginning of the video, this is going to be a tutorial or a guide. You can see I have a whole bunch of different things set up in front of me here. These are pretty much the things that we're going to be going over, and we're also going to be covering the different tools as well. Now, a lot of people are probably going to be thinking that, you know, they already know all of this stuff, so why would I be making this video? And that's because there's a lot of new players coming to the game. Lots of new players to Scrap Mechanic, and they're trying out survival mode for the first time, and there's just a lot to learn, and so I'm getting a lot of questions about some of the basic things every single day. So I wanted to make a video that's going to answer these questions. So if you're watching up to this point, then that means you might be a new player to Scrap Mechanics. So welcome to the game. I hope you're having fun so far, and I hope that this might give you some extra information on how to progress and how to play the game. Uh, so let's start with the basic mechanic tools. I'm talking about the things that the mechanic would hold in his hands or her hands. Uh, so we're going to start with the simple hammer. Now the hammer is a very useful tool. Uh, number one, because you use it, of course, to destroy the hay bots and the tote bots. Now, at this point, you cannot destroy the large red farm bots. Those things are indestructible to the hammer. You have to use spuds. Now, you can use the hammer to destroy the tape bots near the warehouses, but that's extremely dangerous and it's not suggested. So aside from destroying bots with the hammer, it also serves another very crucial purpose, and that is, of course, the ability to chop down trees. So of course, once a tree is chopped down, you can break it down into smaller components, and then you can refine those ones. Very simple thing to do. Now, another thing the hammer can do that you might not have known is it can break two different blocks. It can break the bubble block, and it can break the cardboard block. Now, I'm not really sure if there is a full purpose to being able to break these blocks with your hammer. I tried to think of different things that you might use with an application like this, but at this point right now, it, it might not be very useful. Now, another thing that the hammer can do is it can move loose objects. So you can hit your creations with it. If you ever need to kind of get something unstuck, or maybe you need to move something for some reason, you can do that, and you can also use it to move the caged farmers. So those things can be pretty difficult, but you can actually just hit them with a the hammer all the way to certain areas. Now, the next basic tool is your lift. Now, this is another thing that you start off with, because you start with your hammer and your lift. Now, the lift is very useful for many obvious reasons. One thing, of course, is that you can use it to build on as a platform. This is, you know, like, the fundamental... Thing for the lift. Now, in creative mode, you can use this to save creations and download creations from the workshop, uh, but in survival mode, it's really just a building platform. Uh, so, obviously, you're probably going to be doing that at the beginning of the game, using it to build your structure and using your lift to get underneath things as well. Now, the beauty of building on your lift is that it makes all of the loose items rigid. So, in this case here, if I build a bearing and extend some blocks out, you can see the blocks are still suspended in the air. But the moment I remove it from my lift, you can see that it now becomes a loose object. So that's something that's very important to know when you're using this thing. Now, aside from being able to do all of that, you can also use it to lift yourself up uh, this is very useful for when you're looting different buildings, because some buildings don't actually have any type of stairs to go up to some of the rooftops, but there's still loot up there, so make sure, you know, you build some type of platform off the side, and then use your lift to go up higher and higher. Now, the next tool we're going to look at is the weld tool, which is available from crafting at your craft bot. Now, this is an extremely essential tool. The weld tool allows for you to make major changes to a creation without having to remove the entire thing. So if you imagine I had something here, you know, we've got the bearing right there and I have like some type of giant special creation. This is, this is obviously nothing that's going to be ever useful, but imagine that I have something like this and I want to make some changes to it, maybe somewhere in between here and I don't want to have to remove this entire thing and delete it and work my way back. So what you can do is, of course, you break it down. So one of the functions of the well tool is to pick up loose objects and grab them from any surface. If I wanted to, I could grab it from here. You can see there's a blue square that shows you what you're going to be grabbing. So you grab the piece, and then you can weld it directly back again. Now, one thing you have to remember, though, is every time you remove a block, you're going to want to put a 
block back down again to replace the thing that you removed. And that's what I do with a lot of the trailer systems on the backs of my vehicles. So not only can you pick up loose objects and weld them to other parts, but you can also use the weld tool to create links in between the creation itself. Now, the easiest way for me to show this is by using a little bit of an arm here and then putting something in front of where we have our original bearing. So you can see here, there's a bearing that is underneath that block there. And we're going to put another bearing right here. Now, if I go from this bearing and then bring it over to this section here, uh, this is not actually one piece. If I grab the weld tool, you're going to be able to see all of the individual parts of your build. So here you can see this is all one part and then it's separate from the things in the middle there. So if I put my weld tool over the middle, you can see now this here is its own object and then this one is also its own object. So if we wanted to make this part here in the middle all one object because we have the bearings on either side and we want them to be working together, all you have to do is grab one side or the other Click and hold with your weld tool and then drag over to the other object. Now this is something that not a lot of people might know about when they first get into the game. But clicking and dragging and then letting go again allows for you to create links in between the build. So now when we remove this, you can see these are all one object and both of the bearings are anchoring it down. Now another thing that can be very useful from the weld tool is having the ability to change the global orientation of a build. Now we can prove this by holding what we have here, this, this work of art, on our lift. Now you can see uh, we have the bearing spot right here, we have our extended piece on this side. Now what if we wanted to change the orientation? All you have to do is put something down on the ground and then make your object loose. And now we're gonna use the weld tool to manipulate this on our lift. So I'm gonna grab maybe just like a spot right here and we're gonna weld it to that post. Now when I remove these blocks, we're gonna see that this object has changed globally. And now when I put it on my lift, you can see it's changed completely. It is now in a different orientation. So this can be very useful for when you're building or working on a creation and you really want to have like some long-term access to something. Uh, now an example of this could be perhaps if you wanted to work on a car like the one I have beside me here. Uh, it might be kind of annoying to work on it while it's on the ground like this. So something I could do is extend some blocks out like so. Grab it with the weld tool, bring it over here to the post like this. And now I can even break it off again like so. And so now I have like a brand new orientation. So now I can work on the bottom of my car. And then to revert that back the other way, I would just weld it with the wheels downwards towards the ground. Now another tool that might have some great usage is the paint tool. Now this is something that you craft at the craft bot as well. And this is used to change the color of parts and blocks in the game. Uh, one of the best uses for it, in my opinion, would be to label things by changing the color of them. Uh, more specifically, probably different chests, you know, if you have something inside of a chest and you want to change the color of it to something blue, uh, maybe there's something in there that is blue. Now, in order to access that color panel, though, is you all you have to do is press Q, and this brings up the different colors that you can use. So you just click on one, select it, and then click on the uh, part that you want to paint. Now, parts require one paint ammo per click. So if I wanted to paint this green, that just cost me one paint ammo. Now, one thing that's really important to know, though, is that when you click and drag on the paint tool, uh, it's actually still just one ammo. So if I click and drag here like this, you can see I've covered a huge amount of space with the paint tool. Uh, but in this case, it still only cost me one paint ammo. Now, the only real tip I can give with the paint tool is it's always important to know what you're painting, and if you want to be conservative with your ammo and not waste any of it. So let's say you have a platform like this and you want to paint it a specific color. So in this case, we'll go here, we're gonna pick yellow. Uh, so I want to paint this whole thing yellow. Uh, at this point right now though, it seems like I can't paint all of it at once. No matter what I do, no matter where I grab it, I'm gonna end up having to paint something a second time. Now, this is, like I said, this is the only tip I can really give when painting. Uh, but instead of doing this in two clicks, it's way better to just put a block down like that, and then you click and drag, and then you paint the whole thing, and then you just remove the block that you don't need anymore. So, a little bit of an idea to use when you're trying to not waste too much paint ammo. Also, when you have the paint tool out, you can press R and you reload the paint ammo, uh, which, well, I mean, 
It's not actually reloading anything, but it looks cool. Now, the spud gun is not necessarily a tool, but it is something that you can use for a variety of things in the game. So I'll quickly cover the spud gun. Of course, in order to use it, you need to have your potato ammo either in your backpack or in your toolbar in order to use it. You can't have it in chest near you. It has to be on your person. Now, like I said, it's not necessarily a tool, but it can do a couple interesting things. Uh, first and foremost, you know, you're destroying farm bots and hay bots with it. But another thing that it can do is it can trigger switches and buttons. So if I shoot this, you can see it just turned the switch on. So this is pretty interesting. It's a great way for you to activate traps or uh, different things from certain distances away. Now, I'm actually not 100% sure if it activates a button or not. Now, we can prove this by connecting our button to a logic gate. And look, there you go, you can see that it is activating it for probably one tick. And there's one thing I almost forgot about the spud gun, and that is just like the hammer, of course, you can use the spud gun to break the cardboard and the uh, bubble blocks as well. So this is something that could be good for like dropping heavy things or, uh, making traps and you want to be able to shoot them from far away or something like that. Now for the last hand tool that we're going to be taking a look at, it is the connection tool. Now I'm not going to kind of go over it on its own, it's a very deep subject. So I have a little bit of a playground here set up with all sorts of different things. So I'm going to be explaining the parts and the pieces as well as the connection tool at the same time. So you can see right here I have a separate controller from the rest of the build. Now the reason for that is because I wanted to highlight that in order to use a connection tool, you're your builds have to be part of the same structure. So this controller here is totally separated. You can see there's nothing in between these two builds. Now when I try and click and drag on the controller, you can see everything over here has disappeared. I can't connect it to anything. And that is because there's nothing linking them. So if I use my wooden blocks here and connect the two builds just like so, they become linked. They are now one build. And when I grab my connection tool this time, I'm able to grab them and attach them to different things. Now, knowing this is extremely important for one of the last things that we're going to be taking a look at, and that is the water container, uh, but we're going to get to that in a moment. Before we do, we're going to start right here with some very important parts that you might be using. So the first thing, of course, is the button and the switch. These are fundamental things that you would use in your creations, and they both offer a slightly different variations of what they do. So the switch is a toggle. When you use it, it turns on and the signal stays on until you turn it off again by pressing use again, or if you wanted to use your spud gun, you could do that as well. And the button is different because you have to press and hold it in order for it to accept a signal. As soon as I let go of the use button, you can see it gets depressed. Now buttons and switches can be connected to seats, so you can use your connection tool to connect a button to a seat, and you can also use it to connect a switch to the seat. Now you can see, as we connect them, they get numbered in order of connection points. So I started with this one, so I got one, and the next one is a two. So of course, this one right here is going to end up being a three. But if I wanted to change them around, I could disconnect the two if I wanted to turn that into a three, and then reconnect it again, and then you can see the numbers have shuffled. So in this case, if I removed the button here, which is number one, then the number two turns into one, the three turns into two, and so on and so forth. Now, on a seat, you can only fill up the one toolbar. So you can see down here, there is one to zero. So that's all you got is 10 buttons and switches. Now I've got these switches here set up in front of a logic block. Now logic is not something that I am extremely proficient in. Uh, I do have a basic understanding of using these in scrap mechanic. Uh, and aside from that, uh, my knowledge is kind of limited. So I'm just going to be covering the uh, basic functions of the logic block and its main functions here. Uh, you can use logic blocks to connect them to other logic blocks, which creates logic sequences, which gives you the power to create some amazing things. Now, like I said, I don't really know that stuff. So let's stick to the basics. So the logic gate has six different functions and or X or NAND, NOR, and XNOR. Now these things, they don't really make sense when you just look at them. They do have further descriptions that they're going to be adding to these very soon. Uh, but with this little setup here, I'm able to show you guys how each one of those works. So I have two switches right here and the single logic block. Now this logic block is going to be set up to a controller. Now I'm going to go in more detail with the controller after this. So what I've done is I have made it so that this controller has a door and when the logic is active, the door will open. And so this is going to be a great way to show you guys how it works. Now I'm going to connect both of these switches to the logic gate, 
which means that there are now two different activation points that are going to be used in conjunction with it. So the first function is the AND function, and basically what the AND function means is that all of the triggers need to be activated in order for the logic gate to turn on. Now in this case here there's only two, but if we had three or four, all of those would have to be turned on as well. So in this case here we've got both switches, the logic gate is turned on to AND, so when I turn one switch on you can see nothing happens, but when I turn on the second switch, the door opens. Now the next one is the OR gate. Now the OR gate basically means if any or all of the linked triggers are active. In this case here, we have two of the switches connected to it. So if I turn one of them on, you're going to see that the door is going to open. Now if I turn on the second one, then the door stays open. And that's because, like I said, it's any or all of them. Now the next one is the XOR, which basically means it's active if only one of the triggers is activated. So in this case here with the two switches and this set to X or if I turn one of them on you're gonna see the door open. Now if I turn on the other one then the door shuts. But the interesting thing is if I turn this one off then the door opens back up again and then if I turn this one off the door closes again. Now this is the basic setup for a two switch door. So if you have a door that you want to be able to go through from one side and then shut the door from the other side this is essentially what you would do because you can actually imagine a wall in between these switches. So pretend that this switch is on this side of the door. If I open up the switch on here you can see the door is going to open up. I would go through the door and then on this side of the door, I could just press the switch again and then shut it back. And now if I'm on this side and I need to go back through, then of course you just turn this switch off, which opens the door. You go back through again, and then you shut the door again. Now the three on this side are like the opposite of this one here. So the AND one is if all of the link triggers are active, then it works. But in this case here, if all of the link triggers are inactive, then it works. The NOR would be that only if all of the link triggers are inactive does it work. And the XNOR is if all of the link triggers are active or inactive, it'll then activate. Now like I said, I don't know logic gates very well. I have the basic understanding of them, uh, but hopefully that gives you a little bit more information on how logic gates work. And like I said, you can connect them together and you can create some amazing things. Uh, but now let's move on to the controller. So by pressing the use button on a controller, it brings up the rotation editor. Now it's kind of funny though because there is more to this than just the rotation editor. Now the reason why I say that is because if I connect this controller to a piston, let's say, and then I go back to it, it still, it still says rotation editor, even though I also have uh, the ability to change things in a straight line. But now that's just a little nitpicky thing for me. Uh, so, important things to remember with a controller. The left column right here, it's, it's not really well depicted, but this left column is used as the default or starting position of what you're controlling. Uh, so in this case here we have a bearing and a piston. So this bearing is the same bearing that we were using with the door right here. So if I turn this bearing, let's say 45 degrees into the negative, there you go, you can see the door is now in a position where it's always defaulting to 45 degrees. Now you can change that of course by switching it over to the uh, positive side here and turning it 45 degrees this way, or you can alternatively right click on the bearing to change the direction of it. And being able to change the direction of a bearing also applies to a couple other things here. I have a seat here, if I connect the seat to this bearing it now sets it up as a steering piece. Uh, you can change the, uh, the direction that the bearing spins this way, and you can also hook up motors to bearings. That's another way that you might switch the directions. Uh, basically, the thing you need to remember is when you right-click on a bearing with the arrows like this, it is going to swap the direction. Now, back to the controller. Like I said, this is the default position, and this is where you would create what I would call a sequence, or like a rotation sequence. So, in this case here, this is where the uh, the actual sequence begins, and then you have this many different alterations that you can make before the cycle either ends or starts over again because of this loop function. So let's set the door back to zero here. We're going to make it nice and shut. Uh, so we're going to create a different function. Now, I'm going to simplify this. We don't need to have a logic gate connected to a controller. You can definitely just connect uh, switches and buttons to them. You can even connect seats as well and create drivable vehicles using controllers. Uh, but in this case here, we're just going to use a simple switch that we're going to be able to turn on and off to see what happens. So for this very simple sequence, I want the door to rotate 90 degrees. It's going to stop right there at 90 and then it's going to rotate back again. So it's going to open and then it's going to shut again. And then I want it to pause for one moment 
and then I'm going to basically make it do a full 360. Now it's important to remember that when you create a sequence like this, now obviously this doesn't really have much of a purpose, but if you create a sequence like this, it's going to run the sequence up until the 360 degrees. Now if you have no further values, then this is where the sequence is going to end. Uh, and once you deactivate a sequence, it essentially runs the sequence back in reverse again. So we can show that by activating the switchway here. We're gonna see what we set up. Okay, there it goes. It's doing the 90 degrees, and then it's coming back 90 degrees. And then it's gonna pause for a moment, and then it should do a full 360, and there it goes, 360 degrees. So now it's basically holding the position right here. It's done the full 360, and it is sitting there at this final position. Now, if I wanted to, I could add another function, and then it will eventually read it just like this. Um, if I wanted to. Uh, but that's not really something that's useful. Uh, it's something that you, if you wanted to test different sequences or near the end of a sequence, if you wanted to add more functions. And then like I mentioned, once we press the switch again, it is going to do the reverse of everything. Now there's something very interesting about controllers that I think is very important to know, and that is the way it reads the distances that it wants to travel and at what speeds it does it. So we're gonna disconnect all of this right here, and I'm gonna connect this controller to these two little spots right here that I have set up. So we've got two wood blocks set up on two bearings. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make this rotate one of them 90 degrees like this. And then the other one is going to do the full 360. Now we're going to go full speed as well. So everything is set to as fast as possible. And I want you guys to see what happens when we activate the switch. So let's do it. Well, actually, I'm going to slow it down so we can see that a little bit better. And this time it's going to happen in the reverse. I'm going to press it and look at this. You can see that even though this one was only going 90 degrees and this one was going 360 degrees, they still ended up at their position at the exact same time. And I can show you that again by going back on. You can see that the uh, 90 degree angle turn is going very slow and then the 360 degree angle is going extremely fast to compensate. Now the same thing can be seen here with these pistons. Now pistons don't work unless you have something on top of them. If you don't have a block on top of a piston, I can show you it's just not going to work whatsoever. But if I put a block on it, then you can see it does work. Now like I said, we can check this out with these pistons as well. So I'm going to connect both of these pistons here, now one of them is a level 15 and one of them is a level 1, so uh, they don't extend to the same length. And that's actually very useful in this situation, because if I want this one to extend to 15, and then this one I want to extend to its max at 7, uh, you can see here that they are clearly very different heights, but they still have to achieve the same movement in the same amount of time. So you can see here, the pistons, they shut down at the exact same time, and then we activate them, you can see they rise up at different speeds, so that they end at the same time. Now there's one more thing I have set up right here and that is a timer. Now timers are a pretty special thing, you know. Uh, they're very, very specific in their usage uh, and that is because it is used to delay something from happening. Now the timer is a pretty simple function though. It's just a block that fills up with a specific value. So you can press F on it and you can see we can control our time on it. Now the max time on a timer is of course one full minute and the shortest amount of time you can do is really, it's, it's really quick. Now for this example though, I'm going to set everything to two seconds so that way nothing happens too fast and so that nothing happens too slow. Uh, now timers, like I said, they are just used to create a delay in between something happening. So if we set up our switch here to this timer and activate it, you can see that the timer starts filling up and then after the two second delay, the timer's full and then it sends the signal out. Now, it's kind of hard to see exactly what's happening with just a timer. So I'm going to hook up the timer to a logic block here. We're going to make sure it's just set to AND and then we're going to turn it on. So there we go, we got two second delay and then there you go, you can see that the timer has sent the signal. Uh, now something to remember with timers though is that with this delay, when you deactivate it, it also takes two seconds to delay the off effect. So when I press the switch, you can see that the timer now drains and then it turns off. Now before I move on to the next section of this little spot right here, I wanted to mention something that's very important uh, that can cause some problems uh, and I've experienced this myself as well. So when you're using your connection tool on certain logic things, uh, well pretty much just logic blocks as well as timers, uh, the direction in which you click and drag is going to change how it interacts with that part. Now what I mean is, if you look very closely here, uh, you can see there is a blue line 
with little arrows. Now these little arrows are pointing from the logic gate to the timer. Now if we disconnect this and then connect it from the timer to the logic block, you're going to see these arrows are now going in the opposite direction, which means this is sending a signal to the logic block. Now with this switch connected to the logic block, I can try and turn it on and look at that. The logic block is not turning on anymore, and that's because this is set to AND, which means we need all of the link triggers activated in order for it to turn on. But because this is reading it as a link trigger, like I said, the arrows are going from the timer to the logic block, which means the logic block is receiving the signal, it's not gonna work. Now, if we take our button, though, and hook the button up to the timer, and then we'll hold it for two seconds, now it turns on. So just remember, it is important in a lot of cases when you're doing logic stuff that you click and drag in the right direction. All right, moving on now. We've got the sensor. Now, the sensor is a very important thing, uh, and this is another kind of logic setup. Uh, not quite the same as a timer because it can't receive a signal. It can only send the signal out. So the timer gets hooked up to things like logic blocks or controllers or anything that would kind of act as a switch. Now, the first thing you're going to see is the range. Now, the range is uh, measured in blocks so it starts off at one block and it goes all the way up to 20 blocks and then underneath it here we have the mode now this is very interesting the mode it can be used between a switch or a button uh, which essentially is emulating uh, what we have here but then we have the next function which is the color mode now the color mode is only unlocked once a sensor is upgraded to level 5 then you get the full max length as well as this color mode function now the color mode is actually really 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 useful uh, because once you get it up there and you start using the color mode uh, you can start using a sensor for like multiple functions it's it's really cool but the easiest way I can show you that is by putting a bar here in front of it we've got the sensor on a piston now uh, so we can kind of grab our paint tool here uh, and let's maybe just kind of paint something yellow uh, right about here now I'm going to connect this button to the piston and we're gonna change the sensor here to color mode on and we're going to change it to yellow. Now this color selection here is the exact same colors available on your paint tool here. Now I'm just going to connect the sensor to the logic gate so we can actually see it turning on because we are going to be here behind it. And then we're going to extend our piston uh, to like a long enough length that it's actually going to pass by it. Uh, so once this goes by the yellow square, you're going to see the logic block turn on. Okay, whoa, okay, wait, that was way too fast. All right, again, but slower. There we go. So as that sensor passes in front of that yellow block, you can see it is picking up the signal. Now, I can show you what it's like to use the switch mode, uh, because once we turn it on and it goes past that yellow block, now it stays on. And then if we drop it back down again, it's going to toggle the, uh, the switch back off again. Now, this is something that's pretty interesting, though. If I change the length of this, I think, to maybe 3, if I extend the piston to full length, it stops at the yellow block, and it's a switch, right? Which means it's being pressed right now. And then if we take our hand off of the switch, then it stays on just like any other switch. And then basically this would just mean that it now takes two cycles of going in front of the yellow block and turning on and off. All right, so we're going to move on from these small little parts and pieces. And I'm just going to quickly go over some of the different storage containers and different usages that you might have with them. Now, the first thing I can show actually is uh, this right here. This is a bit of a trick. Now, if you have anything that's on your base that has a bearing and it's in the wrong direction and you want to fix it, of course, you could definitely, you know, just break it and then rebuild it in the direction that you want to. But another thing that you can do if it's something that's larger is you can take a controller and then connect it to the bearing and then disconnect it again. Now, not only can you use a controller for something like that as well, uh, but if I can like quickly move that, uh, you can see it's off in all sorts of directions right now. If I grab our steering wheel and hook it up, it does the same thing. So an important thing to know about the connection tool is when you grab something with it, it eliminates all of the things that it can't connect to. So when I click on this seat and grab it, you can see all of the dots everywhere just disappeared. And that's because I can't connect to them anyway. So it just removes them and shows me the only things that I can actually connect to. Now the same can be said with anything else as well. If I go to a timer, I can't connect them to bearings because that would be useless. Uh, if I go to a switch, I can't connect switches to sensors because the sensor sends the signal. So when I connect a seat to a bearing just like this, it takes on the function of steering. Now that is of course going to convert our A and D keys into a different movement. So when I press A here, you can see it turns left. And then when I press D, it turns to the right. Now if I connect a seat to an engine, I have a gas engine right here. Uh, this is going to adopt the W and S conversion. 
version. So if I take this engine here and then connect it to the uh, bearing right here, you can see that this is now like an extension of the seat converting W and S into forward and backward movement on uh, the bearing that it's connected to. Now, the direction in which this turns for an, an engine or a motor is the direction that W is going to assume. Now, in I, when I rotate it this way, if I press W, it's going to rotate counterclockwise, and then if I rotate it the other way, then it's going to rotate clockwise. Now, I have two different power sources here. I have an electric motor, and I have a gas engine. Now, if you press use on these, you do have the ability to put your gas directly into them, uh, but I just find it way better. I pretty much always use containers when I use these just because I hate having to constantly fill these back up again. So over on this side, I have a gas container as well as a battery container. Now these are used with a connection tool. You grab the gas container and as you can see, there's only two things that I can connect this to. So I can connect this to the gas engine right here and I can also connect it to the thruster. Now these are the two components that use gas as a fuel. Now, of course, in order for me to use the gas container, I have to put some gas in it so I can pick up that gas right there. We're gonna drop the gas in. It's put some gas into the engine and the thruster. So now that the engine has gas in it, we have the seat connected to it. We also have this connected to a bearing here. We make sure it has some type of power value that's going to it. And then we can just hop into the seat. And now when I press W and S, you can see that we can spin that. So of course, you know, this would be uh, usually a wheel or maybe your saw blades or drill blades uh, that you would spin. But it doesn't have to be a seat that controls it. If we disconnect our seat, okay, well, you're going to see that it's going to turn on indefinitely until we turn it off. So make sure that if you ever remove a seat from an engine, uh, you turn off your engine or else your whole car is just going to drive away from you. But we can also use a switch to the seat and then a switch to the gas engine instead of using the seat. Now, this totally removes our ability to use it like W and S for uh, driving controls. Uh, and instead, it only becomes the one direction that you set it to. So in this case here, we have clockwise rotation. So when I hop into the seat and press one, it's going to spin that way. Now behind this here, I have an electric motor as well as a battery container. So we've got batteries here. All we have to do, just like the uh, gas container, is pop some batteries in there. And then we're going to connect the container to the electric motor. And then the electric motor can go to the bearing. And just like the uh, gas engine, we can connect our seat to it just like so. And this is going to give us the same WNS function. Now, once you connect your seat to the electric motor, it is going to function just like a gas engine. It's gonna take WNS and it's gonna rotate this in the specific direction that you set. Now, the main difference between the electric motor and the gas engine is the type of power that it outputs. Now, a gas engine is really good for quick acceleration uh, and some pretty well sustained high speeds. Uh, but the big difference is the electric motor. The electric motor gives way more consistent torque. Uh, so if you were to make something that was for like extreme off-roading, you would actually prefer to use an electric motor because hills won't slow it down as much. All right, now moving on, we have the mountable spud gun. Now this thing is pretty simple to use. Uh, just like your gas and battery containers, this has a spud container. Uh, so we're gonna grab our spuds and we're gonna load them in just like so. So now that we have our spuds in the container, we're just going to connect this container to the mountable spud gun, and I've got a button right here that we can hook up to the spud gun just like that. And then all you have to do is press the button, and it's going to shoot a spud. Now beside this, I have a seat. Now the seat is a lot like a driver's seat, except it doesn't have the WASD conversion controls. Uh, so I just wanted to make, basically show you guys that you can hook stuff up to it, uh, mainly buttons and switches, and you can control things like that as well. Now, the last thing I wanted to show is the water container and the water cannon. Now, I've seen a lot of new players uh, that are very confused with how these work and how you draw water and bring it to the cannon. Now, it's a lot easier than what I think a lot of people realize when they first start out with the game. Now, I'm going to reclaim a whole bunch of these blocks because I'm going to need them to show you. Now, a lot of people think that you need the uh, glass tubes here uh, in order to draw water from the pump into the container and then to the cannon. But that is actually far from the truth. All you need to do is bring a single line of blocks. I mean, realistically, you can use whatever you want to, uh, but as long as the blocks connect the main points all the way to the main build, that's all that matters. So we've got the water container. We're gonna bring it over to this little spot that we did here. Now, like I mentioned, a lot of people were using the uh, the glass tubes from the container all the way to their farm. It was it was really impressive to say the least. 
Uh, but it was unfortunate that they didn't realize that all you had to do was put something like this with a whole bunch of blocks to the water and then turn your vacuum pump to uh, retrieve the water into the container. So now, because these are connected as one build, we can use the connection tool to drag our connection point from the water container all the way over here to the water cannon. So now, despite the fact that our water container is extremely far away, we're still able to put a button down right here, hook it up to the water cannon, and then shoot water out. Alright, so that is going to be it for today. I really hope that this information was helpful to some of you. Uh, like I said at the beginning, if you already do all this stuff, I'll make sure you leave a like on it anyway. Uh, if you did enjoy the video, then make sure you leave a like on that as well. Uh, now, of course, this is only scratching the surface of Scrap Mechanic. There are some crazy advanced things that you can do. Uh, and I definitely encourage everybody to explore and build crazy things and push your own creative limits. Now, guys, if you want to tune in for some more Scrap Mechanic, then be sure to subscribe to the channel, uh, maybe even turn on your notifications so you get the latest and the craziest coming from me in Scrap Mechanic. Now, I have got a lot of work to do here to set up my base, uh, so I'm going to get to that, and I will be seeing you guys very soon. So see you in the next one, and bye for now.